Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Good afternoon and welcome to today's episode of the Freight Insider Podcast, where we are opening the doors to the business of freight. I'm your host, Paige Ciplon. I always say that freight is the common denominator in this complicated math problem that we call our economy. Literally every business is touched by freight, but the how it touches us and how it touches companies really varies greatly. Some exist to move the freight, others track it, some manufacture it, um, while others receive it and share it with consumers and other businesses. The business of freight is complicated, exciting, and frankly, all too well kept of a secret weapon for business. Today, I have a really special guest joining me, an old friend, you could say. He has over 30 years of experience in manufacturing and marketing paper and tissue products, packaging cellulose, specialty fibers, building products, and a whole bunch of other related materials. Uh, the list is long for sure. Starting with the company in 1989, he relocated to Europe from Atlanta in 92 and has led many divisions of his company for, for many years. In 2017, he was named president and CEO of Georgia Pacific. Today's guest is Mr. Christian Fisher. Welcome to the Freight Insider, Christian. Paige, happy to be here. Thanks very much. And so good to reconnect uh, with it you. It's been too long. To yeah, it's been a while. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. It's, we've got a lot of great content to cover and uh, a lot of great stories about your journey and about your Georgia Pacific's journey when it comes to freight. Um, just sort of kick things off, uh, like we were discussing before the show started, uh, we like to start off with your own personal freight journey and kind of where you built up to, to where you are now as CEO and president of, uh, of Georgia Pacific. But, you know, interesting, you know, I was in the, the Marine Corps and I often joke that I used to be freight, uh, and was shipped around the country and it shipped around the world, um, as cargo, as freight. Um, and you grew up in Germany, um, your Southern accent sort of gives that away, but you lived in Brazil, but I, I know you've got an interesting story of actually kind of being freight yourself and uh, getting over here to the United States uh, on a cargo vessel. Tell us, tell us a little more about, about that beginning of your journey together. Yeah, thanks Paige. Uh, yeah, in, in, indeed. Um, you know, when I was about 19, 20, I had finished high school in Brazil and I knew for whatever reason, I knew that I needed to go back to Germany where I grew up as a kid up to the age of 10 to, uh, to, to go to university. And at that time, I mean, uh, air tickets were just more of a luxury good than they are today to many of us. And neither did my, my mom have that much money to kind of, you know, spurge on an airline ticket. But at the age of 20, you got time, right? And uh, I, I had time. So I had heard from a friend that you could actually get over the Atlantic Ocean from Brazil to Europe on a cargo ship, a container vessel, <laughs> you qualified to work on there. So you had to work while you're on. At that time, it took, I don't know, more than two weeks, maybe 17 days, I don't remember. And, uh, you know, all you had to get on and then you had to work yourself over that. And, and that was it. And I said, well, that's what I'm going to do. And I, after a, a few attempts, I, I really got hired. <laughs> I remember one thing painfully, uh, Paige, I had just, I think, broken or at least severely injured. Uh, I think it was the ring finger of my right hand, and I'm a right-hander. Wow. And I'm saying, well, that's going to be bode very well for physical labor for, for two days. But of course, I couldn't tell anybody about that. Right. And uh, as soon as I greeted the captain and he squeezed my hand, I was just saying, oh, my gosh, this <laughs> is going to be a long trip. Anyway, but really, so container vessel and, you know, as the, the, the guy on the bottom of the totem pole, you get to do all the work. That, uh, that nobody else wants to do. And this was like cleaning out rust, painting, fixing little things, washing the deck every day, and so on right. and so forth. You get a little bit of insult and injury too from, from the crew that says, oh, here's the new guy. Let's, you know, throw a bucket of water on him at 6 a.m. That kind of stuff, right? But well, it's good work ethic for sure. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So look, this was, I would just say, my, my first personal longer, more intimate uh you know, uh, journey, if you will, really figured mm -hmm. it and, 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 uh, and really with freight where I felt a little bit like you, I was part of the cargo, if you will. <laughs> uh, but you know, uh, 
many learnings. Of course, I picked a few things up about how a vessel works and what it does and et cetera, right? That freight piece, if you will. Uh, but secondly, I would just say the lessons uh, there too and the respect that you build for the people that are in that profession of making freight happen. In this case, people on a boat, the crew. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, not, it's not hard to, to connect that to pilots that spend a lot of time away from their family, to truck drivers who spend endless days and weeks on roads, etc. You really gain a lot of resp re respect for the personal sacrifice uh, and contributions these people in those professions make. And last but not learn, at least you learn something about life on the two. And you learn how big the ocean is <laughs> because there's yes. nothing else to see for 17 days or so. Yeah. But anyway, I leave it at that. But I, again, a, a journey that 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 really made freight, freight come alive for me. Yeah, you're right. It's a people business for sure. And I think it's uh, I think it's probably why you're such partly such a great leader at Georgia Pacific and everything you've done through your journey. Uh, you know, learning about the people first and foremost, and that that it is a people business. We we joke in the trucking industry; those trucks don't drive themselves, right? No, yeah, not I mean, yet. Not yet. It's coming. Yet. It's a whole other podcast we can do. But, right. um, but it's certainly um, it's certainly a people business. So so you got to Brazil, and then you continued your journey um, professionally. I have in my notes here: you were a market pulp sales manager, which mm -hmm. I guess describes itself. Tell us kind of where you went from there. Yeah, I mean, I, I've even started a little bit earlier, but it's just for context and not to yeah. bore your audience. But when I then got to Germany and I needed a job to get me through college on the other side, I found a job in a Brazilian pulp company and that's how I got into the pulp or cellulose business. And this was a small office, four or five people that managed all aspects of selling and distributing the product in Europe. Mm. And you know, as, as in such a role, you get into everything, right? Because it's just too small an office to kind of compartmentalize things. So I, one of the tasks I had was cargo inspection, bill of lading reconciliation or distribution, um, you know, booking freight that could be truck, that could be inland marine transportation, you name it. I got into that. When I got into five years later, I was hired by Georgia Pacific in Europe as a pulp sales manager. Uh, also, very small office, I would say with more capability coming back out of the United States, but still a heavy element of what I described in my earlier job. And, you know, so I think the more of the story here, uh, this was my, my, my upbringing, if you will, and learning in freight business was by doing by looking around, by doing, by learning a lot from freight forwarders, from truckers, from boat people, et cetera. And it was a kind of, you know, a, a super education in that, in that context. And I think the, the other thing you, you, you learned that I learned is how, how important that, that is to actually service your customers well. Yeah, and actually doing it. You don't learn that in college. That's, you don't no. get that out of a textbook. I don't think so. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, well, I think a lot of great leaders um, are, are like that, who have done it. You look at the stories that have been told about UPS, for example, you know, all the executives in your role at CEO started off as a driver in, in Home Depot. I know Mark Holifield, who we both know well, spends time going into the stores and interacting with customers and really getting down to the grassroots, if you will. Uh, I think it's an important part of, of all the freight journeys that we've, that we've talked about uh, with guests. So, um, so then we fast forward, you, you've had multiple roles uh, and people can check out the website and read your bio, the different roles you've had over the years, uh, a long tenure with Georgia Pacific. Uh, and now you're the president and CEO. Um, just for our audience's background, uh, if, unless they've been asleep under a rock, Georgia Pacific is one of the largest consumers of uh, forest and consumer product largest manufacturer of consumer and forest products, uh, nearly 30,000 employees based in Atlanta. Uh, Georgia, Georgia Pacific operates three key businesses, building products, lumber, plywood, panels, wall boards, um, packaging and cellulose, container board boxes, um, and, uh, and consumer products, um, bath tissue, um, <laughs> paper towels, disposable plates, cups, cutlery, variety of other consumer products, um, both for the home and away from home. Um, Georgia Pacific's big brands include AngelSoft, um, 
quilted northern brawny dixie cups uh, really if you're looking at a paper product or anything consumable in the grocery store or at the home depot uh, it's probably made or georgia pacific has their hands in it as well georgia pacific is part of coke industries one of america's largest private companies um, and so with all that going on and all that freight moving around it seems like sort of a rhetorical question but why is freight so important to Georgia Pacific. I mean, you're not a logistics company, but you, it seems like you couldn't do what you do without freight and logistics. No, I, number one, first of all, you've done the homework, you summarize what GP does and where we are. Easy so to do. Yeah. Uh, and the only thing I add is, uh, again, most of our manufacturing, and that's key to you to answer your question, Paige, is actually done in the United States. But again, we source materials for it and we ship our goods all over all over the, the, the globe. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we make a lot of stuff, we, we buy a lot of stuff and we ship a lot of stuff and that's where freight come, comes, uh, comes in. So um, really, I mean, it's, it's, I, would, I would just say this, I mean, you, we, we, we couldn't do what we do if we didn't know the business of freight well, although I don't know, we probably uh, own a couple of flatbed trucks and some rail cars here and there, but you know, that, that pales into comparison about what we ship every day. Uh, but we got to do it really well, be really knowledgeable. And, and it is a source of, you know, competitive advantage, one. I mean, if, if you don't pay attention to that, uh, with the billions of dollars we spend in, in a year of, again, moving stuff around, uh, then, then you can be uncompetitive. And two, it's right. really, I mean, it's the key to serve your customers well. And I, I think these are the two key takeaways, Paige, so that you say without it and without knowing it, we couldn't be successful. That's right. Yeah, I mean, freight, I mean, just a couple stats here that uh, you had, you know, 1,800 trucks coming into your facilities every weekday, 5,000 loads of logs, 1,500 loads of chips every weekday, 50 million pounds of finished goods coming in out of your facilities. Uh, it's information that you, your team yeah. has provided. Um, you know, just incredible. And you talked about serving the customer. I mean, those are all things your customers are depending on, whether it's, you know, toilet paper during a pandemic and, and other times for sure, mm -hmm. um, whether it's logs and for our building communities, um, it's it's huge uh, what you guys do. So our understatement of the probably the century saying you guys ship a lot of stuff. Uh, Absolutely. Most about everything. Um, so tell me a little bit more. So obviously freight is a big focus of, of your role and your, your many employees and your team's role. But what are some of the things that Georgia Pacific is, is focusing on um, from a freight perspective or a freight related perspective uh, these days in particular? Yeah, Paige, Paige I, I, I always like to start at 100,000 foot level because if people get that, then they know what guides our thinking and actions and everything. Good. Not always perfectly, but that's the intent and the aspiration. What we, and, and some of that is timeless, if you will. But sometimes you really need to, again, refocus as an organization on those things. So at the highest level, Paige, what comes to mind is really making sure that all of our employees, but also our business partners, understand one thing. What we are really focused on and intentional and purposeful on is to fulfill the best in what, how we interpret the role of a business in society, plain and simple. Right. But and what is that for us? Well, it is to really help our customers improve their lives, you know, in the space that we're in, right? And where we can make a difference. That doesn't mean we alone will change their lives, but we will help them improve their lives. One, and how? Well, by giving them better alternatives than the, the otherwise have, one. And two, and this is very, very important because at the heart of it, it has the message of stewardship and some people call it sustainability. But that is doing that while consuming fewer resources. So, you know, you don't waste stuff. You take care of the environment. You really are thoughtful about how you produce things and so on and so forth. Uh, very key. So focus on, on that. Within that, you know, you have, you have a vision where you say, and that's what I meant by from time to time, you got to refocus the organization on, on that even more so than in the, the past, maybe, which is the focus on the customer. So your most important constituency, they pay the bills. If we don't have them, everything else becomes fiction. So focus on the customer pretty well. And how do you focus on the customer very well? Well, you, you, you are guided by a couple of 
call it principles or underlying key things that you always got to keep in your mind. One is just to say, hey, look, we're only working here for mutual benefit because if the customer doesn't take any benefit from dealing with us, I mean, all you know, all right. that stuff. Uh, two, you try to actually again give them better alternatives, which means what you're really trying to do is become their preferred supplier. We call that develop those preferred partnerships. But they got to choose you as the preferred partner. It's not just you choosing them. <laughs> so you got to do, do that. And you know, and the we better start. alternatives in a world that we interpret today uh, as moving faster, changing faster, being disrupted more fast, including on, on freight, uh, uh, more, more than ever in, uh, in, in history, certainly in most of our lives. Uh, you just say, well, I gotta stay. I, I gotta stay really in tune with what's changing, and embrace something which is key here, which is a concept of we are in this game called perpetual transformation. Don't transform once and then think I've arrived. No, no, you've got to perpetually transform because the world's transforming, and otherwise you don't serve your customers with better alternatives. That's that. And the last thing I'll say to that is, you know, uh, of course you try to. I say, of course, I, I want to call it out. There's more constituencies than your customers, but I started with the customer. But obviously, if you're not a good partner and the best partner in the community in which you produce, if you're not a good, um, you know, a preferred partner of regulators, if you're not a best uh, partner um, of suppliers, well, then again, you become weaker in servicing your customers. But the absolute key without which none of that happens is our employees. So really creating the environment where everyone can actually to the best of their specific innate capabilities contribute to the success and have a personal journey of transformation and, and ultimately fulfillment and we call it self-actualization, then all bets are off. So we're, you know, we're focusing very much, and maybe we'll talk more about that, focusing very much on creating that environment where that is not just a bunch of nice words, mm -hmm. but where that is really lived every day. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, that status quo is, to use my words, status quo mm -hmm. can be a killer for business. Absolutely. I don't care if you're a paper company or, or not. I mean, it, even technology companies, I, I love the way you describe transformation um, of your business, but also transforming and continually evolving your culture. Uh, you talked about your employees. Um, I, I know not to jump ahead too far because, well, I'm sure the pandemic and how it's affected your company will will come up. But uh, companies are transforming themselves now from a culture perspective on on how they need to better serve their employees as their customers, right? Because you got to like, think of them as customers as well. Uh, we've gone to more of a hybrid role here in our office here at Team One Logistics, and uh, it'd be interesting to hear how you moving along but um so talk a little bit about what you're most excited about what are some of the you know maybe pet projects if you can talk about them or you know what are you most excited about at georgia pacific you know now into the, the short-term future yeah well you know i um and you can always follow up with more questions uh here uh and more specificity if if your audience uh likes that but there's a lot of call it tactical uh, or even structural stuff going on in our markets as we interpret it, that is really exciting, right? I mean, one of, one of them is coming out of the pandemic, mm -hmm. for example, you, you, you know, while, while, while people bought enough toilet paper along the way um, and now are kind of destocking to kind of normalize what they have in their pantry uh, for good reasons. Uh, one, one trend seems to be sticking around, which is a higher sensitivity, need, want, appreciation for hygiene in general. So we see a lot of that in, in, um, in, in our away from home business where people say, hey, look, I had something else on my wall or nothing. It could be an air blower or it could be, uh, you know, you just took towels out of a stack to dry your hands. I now want it to be not air blowing around there and you know, disseminating germs or something like that. Yeah, about but that. I want it to be good paper towels, but I don't want to touch the device from which they come. <laughs> so there's a lot of, of yeah. uh, more emphasis, renewed emphasis on touchless hygiene, let's put it away, away from home, but also in terms of our towel business. And, you know, my competitors from the best we can tell are seeing the same thing, right? Um, is people are just using more of that one-time 
clean, cleanliness uh, aid, call it a paper towel to dry your hands, to wipe off stuff right. more often at home. And we think that's a trend that will stay. To what extent and for how long, I don't know. But anyway, so that's pretty exciting how you position yourself to take a, advantage of that. The other one, you know, I, I could mention certainly about our building products, a business where, you know, it's just fascinating to see how much of an emphasis and spend and focus people had put during the pandemic or during the, the worst part of the pandemic in putting money back into their house and, you know, repair, remodel, et cetera. That alone could have kept us busy. And now you get this pent up demand on housing that who, who knows how long that will stay around page, but it's just absolutely crazy. And how do you position yourselves to service your customers better in that? And last but not least, just to have one example for another business. I mean, I, I mean, obviously more stuff is landing in our doorsteps day to day, right? We all got that custom to, hey, ship it home, right? Right. Uh, and so more boxes are landing at our doorsteps every day. And I mean, that in itself is a very, very interesting uh, opportunity, but also challenge because people say, oh, that's good. But oh, now I have all these boxes at home and, you know, is, is it going to waste or how do you think about that? And there's a little guilt out there. So great opportunities to work with, you know, the broader consumer base to uh, take advantage of that. But I, I put all those in tactical. I go back to a couple of things. What I really feel super excited about is one, that transformation in that world that's going on and changing so fast. Does yep. it cause some stress on me and my people? You bet. You bet. It's a question of survival, but of course we want to thrive. But of course there's always tension in there. But that the transformation and going through all that change in our lifetime right now so fast and trying to figure out, you know, how to position myself is super exciting. Secondly, uh, Again, we talk about these preferred partnerships. I think when you have that purpose and deliberately pursue it to really go deeper and say, what does this mean? And what do I really do differently and better? So all these different constituents choose us to be their preferred partner. I think that is, I mean, super exciting a journey. And last but not least, I go back to the people and say, you know, enabling the 30,000 people, but also our business partners to really contribute to the best that they can. Mm -hmm. I mean, and how do you actually wake up in the morning and say, this is my mission? Because from that, good stuff will happen. Just trust that it will happen. Uh, I think that gets me out of the bed in the morning. Yeah, well, I think the first step is getting out of bed in the morning and saying, this <laughs> yeah. is my mission, and then going like you're talking about and having to, to execute on it. I mean, that's, yes. that's key. Um, so you talk a lot about transformation, um, both, again, I think really important, not just from a business perspective, but from a, a culture perspective and transforming mm -hmm. to make your, your workplace a better place to, to drive your internal customers as well as your employees, as well as your external customers. What are some other examples of the way you're transforming um, your approach to freight and supply chain partnership wise, uh, perhaps, and how you're transforming your supply chains, how you handle freight? Well, um... I'll start by saying this again, go back to what you, uh, you, you observed. I mean, we, we do a lot of freight, but we're, we don't own any. That's right. Uh, and as big uh, uh, and important a facet that is component is of our daily business, um, we know that we don't have all the answers. So, um, you know, it's been a few years ago, maybe it's, maybe it's decades. I don't, I don't remember because I don't, I wasn't in a consumer business at that time page, our consumer business, um, but they had developed an in-house capability, which they call KBX logistics. It's still called KBX today. Right. Um, and, um, and, uh, and KBX used to handle the freight for the consumer business division. Today it's, kind of morphed, if you will, evolved into a capability that handles the freight, not just for all of GP, but also for all of Coke Industries. Oh, wow. And on, on top of that, they, that the capability which gives us, we, we're convinced actually in many aspects, a competitive edge uh, is also being brought forth and uh, to third parties out there. Anybody who wants to do business with us, those can be customers, they can be suppliers. Um, and, and a lot of partners, obviously, that have the hard stuff, the rail, 
the, the trucks and so on and so forth. We live by the partnerships and the mutual benefit, again, that we create with those folks, right? I mean, other than that, it would be a one-sided story and it would be a short-term story. So by, by, by allowing KBX to be the capability that leverages our scale, but also the information they have and being, a call it a one-stop point mm -hmm. of access and cooperation with, with our vendors in freight is one of those things. And it's through those cooperations, quite frankly, that you again create capabilities uh, that are that would otherwise be outside of our own and would never get there. So a couple of examples, maybe that are not always directly related to KBX, but things on how we how we think about that and practice this. So one 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 example. I mean, stay within KBX for a second. I mean, with KBX and the business, you can obviously cooperate very very transparently with one another because we work for the same owner so we're in the same sandbox if you will right right so by by cooperating with kbx we actually contributed to them developing a, a smart logistics freight system that helps schedule and avoid empty trucks going back and forth optimize freight between different point suppliers uh, uh, and, and and buyers and you know, I, I would I would I would not give you the right number of of, of mileage and hours and gallons of fuel saved uh, um, uh, page, but it's it, it goes into the millions of miles spent, uh, trucking hours spent, uh, you know, fumes exhausted are not put into the air, sure. and this is real <laughs> money saved. So again, here good good business. And good environmental outcomes on top of that, right? And benefiting yeah. broader society. And you know, it got many EPA awards for smart for, for smart freight, etc. That we're proud of. But again, great work as an example. Another one that goes a little bit again more into the innovation side, cooperating with a third party. Uh, in 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 this case, um, Outrider is the name of the company. And Outrider, we have a lot of warehouses out there and distribution centers. Some attached to our facilities, some not. So uh, one of the areas that is always a challenge and gives us a lot of head headache, not just from operationally operational side, but also from a safety side, is those those yards, those those yards where a lot of empty trucks sit and get paired around with cargo and and move up to the facility and get loaded and unloaded and get spotted, etc. Very tricky environment, very challenging environment. Without rider, they developed a capability that we're piloting right now that essentially gets all the people out of that business and through sensors and uh, self-driving vehicles and software and algorithms etc they get the job done better and without putting anybody in jeopardy so yeah. that's just one of the experiences we said uh, that that again we couldn't come up with that and they need a place, a lab, where people are saying, I'm going to be willing to try that out. So that's a second, a second example. And the third one is, you know, a company that since I think recently they've, they've actually been, been acquired by somebody else. So they must have done a good job. And maybe we helped them do a little bit of that. Is The company is called Clear Metal. And Clear Metal started out at least with an, with an edge to say, go back to shipping. And our cellulose business that ships 70% of, of, of their business outside the United States in containers and, and, and other, uh, other boats, right. for any country around the world, pretty much. Uh, but really, did we know when our cargo would actually arrive at the customers early, late, or on time? No, we only knew once the customers told us, which been, well, at that time they knew, but that's not how things trick today. Clear Metal had, uh, had developed a, a really, a, a really um, a smart way of anticipating probably better than even the ocean freight liners and the logistics folks in between and the customers and ourselves about when that boat would get or the cargo would arrive at your dock uh, and ultimately at your destination. So uh, by working with them, we were really able to make a, a big different page, difference page on you know, giving our customers more visibility and tools to plan their operations and the purchases by cooperating with a third party. So those are some concrete examples of how we yeah. work also with others. Those are great. Those are great examples. Uh, you know, the, 
the transparency of, of information. We've talked about supply chain visibility, you know, in the textbooks at Georgia Tech, right, and, and other places. Uh, but sometimes, you know, sometimes that information is even more valuable from the cost perspective than the actual cargo it's carrying sometimes. And that, that knowledge can be real power. Um, you, you know, I'll back up to your, you mentioned uh, transformation, you mentioned sustainability and being in the forest products industry. I know sustainability is, is a cornerstone of your, of your business and all your business lines. Um, I'll, I'll fill in a couple gaps here um, because mm-hmm. I happen to have these numbers in front of me. Um, so going back to the KBX and the transformations that, have, that KBX has brought to your olive coke industries, but GP in particular, um, it allowed you to cut 4 million unnecessary non-revenue miles for 2,000 drivers, saving 600,000 gallons of diesel and eliminating engine idling at our facilities, um, saved 400,000 gallons between 2018. That removed 4,200 metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions. And I'll, I'll brag for you since you're a humble guy, those are numbers that are, that are plausible and yeah, yeah. very admirable. Um, and I think worth worth putting out there. And you've had three different EPA SmartWay awards. Yeah. And great. We, I think that is a great job. Example. Give you the data. So, yeah, I think that is a great example of again going back to the role of business and society, and where I tell you, and consuming fewer resources. I mean, this goes hand in hand, right? You provide better alternative, and you consume fewer resources. There's your textbook example. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a perfect example, and I, I, not to throw those numbers in there, but I think our audience really needs to hear how, how right. big of an impact that your, your company is really having on uh, that number of many of products and, and actually doing it in a sustainable fashion, for sure. Um, so you talked a little bit about, we talked about transformation, you know, green uh, is, is, I don't even know if they use the word green anymore, but sustainability, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> green, green for business too, right? I mean, because it can, it doesn't have to be red. It can be, it can create black for your business uh, from a profitability perspective. How, how do your words, do you think winning at that transformation uh, from whatever perspective, how do you think that's going to help shape the future of your, of your young company? <laughs> the young company. Yeah. We're, we're pushing a hundred years. You're, you're an old startup, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, 1927, if I, if I get that right. Uh, so um, soon to be a hundred, but uh, you know, I like to say this page um, that uh, there is really no alternative but this perpetual transformation that just isn't. Because yeah. if you believe that the world is in constant creative destruction, it's always around us, sometimes faster, sometimes broader, sometimes slower, etc. but it's always around us, you have no alternative to transforming. And, you know, there may be a lot of details buried in it, but if, if, if we go back to the S&P 500 and look at who was around uh, 20 years ago and who is not around today. I mean, 50% of those companies that were there 20 years ago are gone. Now, some of them may have been absorbed by others, et cetera, but okay. But it, it tells you a pretty, pretty big story that not transforming, it's just not an alternative. So that's, that's number one. And, you know, so, uh, and therefore I think, uh, Paige, uh, to make that really come alive, to our 30,000 people, but also our partners in business mm-hmm. is, is key. And that's one thing. And number two is, um, I mean, so basically it's, you're never done folks. We're never done. But if you think about, wow, it's happening so fast and it's all the time, how do I survive without just going like, you know, like oof, I break up, I explode, I can't do it anymore. Well. I think this is where, again, we need to create an environment where, where we, including myself, understand that, look, we're running a marathon, but within that marathon, you have a lot of sprints, mm-hmm. but you can't just sprint all the time, 100% of the time, all the time. You just blow up. I mean, at least that's what I believe. You will make so it. To make people believe, hey, we're, you're never done. You always got to transform. Um, amongst those things, there's projects, there's transformation things that you got to be really fast and you got to make, make, yeah, efficient, make your, make your mistakes early, right? Figure out what doesn't work. That's part of that and not get discouraged by it. I mean, that is, is key in there. And again, who is going to make it happen? But individuals, you've got to bring this point home that for people to feel excited about this, embrace it, know that they're constantly learning and that the company is there really not just in words, but they're in actions 
to help you to enable you to do the journey yourself i mean those that's that's how we will win that this transformation thing make yeah. it really meaningful to people no you're right i mean that that transformation is key and that's part of why we're doing this podcast is to share that story i, I think and i felt i've talked about it publicly for years that we have a problem of perception in our industry in freight and supply chain trucking in particular uh, where we have major shortfalls in the number of professional drivers that we need but you know and that impacts your business it impacts impacts everyone so how do we how do we get that message out there it's part of the reason we wanted to hear your personal freight journey and <clears throat> get people excited you know freight is sexy i think you know freight when we need to be able to tell that story uh, and get great people into your business and into you know the logistics industry and into manufacturing companies that that really get it and are excited about transforming and the innovation that that is inherent as part yeah. of the supply chain yeah sure um so that said you know that problem of perception uh, that communication issue that we've had, and this is a decades old problem, I'm telling that story. It, it, so you've been out of this for a minute, uh, 30 year journey um, uh, on container ships and from yeah. Brazil and Germany and through the ranks at, at Georgia Pacific. If you were going to go back to, you know, the Christian Fisher getting, getting ready to shake that pilot's hand and have him crush your broken finger, what, what would you be telling him as sort of some tips and tricks or things you've learned along the way uh, that would help guide some of the younger folks and others that are just starting their freight journey today? Well, I, you know, a combination of things uh, come, comes, comes to mind. Um, let me reach, reach back the furthest, furthest first. I think like on anything and, and freight, and we agree, right? S especially if you're in a manufacturing business and you really live off support, making stuff and ultimately delivering stuff to someone and buying stuff to make all that happen, et cetera. Right. You can't not, not think about freight as an existential and competitive advantage uh, and a, a means to better serve your customers, one. That's right. uh, so I would challenge anyone who is in that world and just saying, hey, do your own personal journey, whatever it might, might be. Hey, I don't know if that's driving on a truck or working somewhere. I mean, find that, find a little bit more of that personal connection to it to have a deeper appreciation. It won't make you an expert unless you, you know, want to go on that trajectory, but uh, it gets you some grounding. It gets you some appreciation. It creates some respect. And I think then you can build it from there. So that's the number one. Hey, for simple thing, for show business, I would just say, hey, make your own journey. Take the boat is what I would say. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's number one. But number two, uh, and to the challenges, but also opportunities that we've been talking about in general, but also in freight. I mean, hey, look, I mean, I could look at glass half empty, glass half full and all this stuff, right? All the changes and the stuff we've been joking about or referring, hey, the real driver short very well maybe tomorrow whenever tomorrow is maybe there won't be drivers or it will be restricted now you can restrict it meaning less fewer drivers for different different uses maybe i i don't know uh so there will be disruptive elements and there are disruptive elements out there and those changes will change how we do business right i mean hey look if drone deliveries become that much important. If self-driving cars, forget trucks, delivered to the home and, and at a different cost structure, right? And they can always be circling because you don't have a driver that gets exhausted, et cetera. Right. Uh, the database or the data that can be gleaned off all those touch points and freights, et cetera, and optimized locally and around the world through in additional visibility, I mean, you just say, on the one hand, you can say, oh my gosh, this is going to be terrible. Yeah, it will disrupt some businesses for sure, especially those that don't transform. But on the other, how exciting is it? How much opportunity does it create? And it creates a super opportunity for people that want to learn and apply and try something new to do just that. And it opens new worlds that are super, super exciting. I think that's that's the story and that's what i would emphasize in here and that's what we're all trying to embrace and constantly learn what's right. out there yeah no keep your eye on the ball and, and just start the journey there's so many different pathways that you know whether you're like you said manufacturing i said it at the the, the intro to the to this podcast it's the whole idea it's a it's a complicated ecosystem whether yeah. you manufacture it or ship it or track it or or make it um logistics and the different paths that 
uh, young folks and, and older folks can get into and be part of as part of their freight journey. Um, well, Kristen, this has been great. I, um, if people want to get engaged, if they want to join your team, I, I, can, I can imagine many would want to come work for you and your team at Georgia Pacific um, or, or one of the other partners that you mentioned. How, how can they connect with you uh, to reach out and, and learn more about Georgia Pacific or some of your other partners? Well, I mean, so since you touched on two dimensions, I'll answer at least on, on, on those two very briefly. Look, okay. when it comes to the business of freight, you know, selling cargo, buying cargo, because you got an idea, but I, I got something that I, you know, that you guys might be interested in, willing to try, etc. can solve your problem. Go to KBX, simple. Go to kbx.com, figure out. They will respond. Remember. They're very responsive. That is their business. Uh, so that's that's number one. Number two, if it is more on the personal level and hey, this, it would always be great in the in the context of we want to be you know the employer of choice. If anybody says, "Wow, that sounds like an interesting company," and you really look for a specific job, well, I'm just saying, hey, look, it's easy to go jobs at GP or jobs at Coke Industries, and whoop, there's a there's more than you care to, care to know in terms of sure. what's out there. And we got lots of openings that we have and we'd love for people to show interest and in, in connect to us. And, la and last but not least, but in that same vein about uh, getting to know more, uh, more people, hey, look, in many places, at least 150 across the nation, and especially also in Atlanta, you're bound to know somebody who knows somebody at GP or Coke Industries if you want to know more, more about the company and opportunities and how we can cooperate. Hey, just ask around. You'll find somebody and that somebody will find connect you with the right person. So uh, I, I hope that we we triggered or, or strengthened some of the interest in our company. It's a great one to work in. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been there for 32 years. <laughs> yeah, it's a testament to how great of a company that you're running now and that you've been part of for, for so long. And I would argue creating how great it is, how great it is today. Thank you. Christian, this has been fantastic. I, I've, I've got 100 more questions and I'm sure our audience does. I'd love to dig into the KBX some more and get into some more details there. Maybe there's <clears throat> we can have, continue that conversation in a later podcast with some of your colleagues. Um, this, has been, this has been great. Hopefully you enjoyed listening. Uh, Christian, thanks again for your time. Uh, on behalf of the Freight Podcast, uh, Freight Insider Podcast, thank you for joining us. Um, if you enjoyed listening to Christian and other executives like Christian, uh, make sure you like us and follow us so you don't miss anything. And, and remember, as Christian said, enjoy your own personal freight journey. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at supplychainnow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts. And follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now. Supply Chain Now.